Hi, you're watching Monday Night Live. My name is Brendan Malone, and today I'm going to be speaking to Melody Pilgrim. Melody was born and raised in Gloria Vale, the controversial and very, very secretive commune that was founded in 1969 here in New Zealand by Neville Cooper, or Hopeful Christian, as he is known inside the commune. In October 2019, she left with her four daughters to join her husband, who had left 10 months earlier. She's now settled in South Canterbury and is speaking up about her experiences inside Gloria Vale in the hope that they will bring about some much needed and very positive change. I can tell you right now that this conversation that I had with Melody was one of the most impacting discussions I've had with anybody on Monday Night Live. And I was someone who thought they knew all about Gloria Vale, but even I learned things and I was actually shocked by some of the revelations that she has to share about the experiences they had living inside the Gloria Vale commune. So without any further ado, let's have this important conversation with Melody Pilgrim. Melody, thank you so much for being with us here to have this important conversation. Let's start at the very beginning and try and get a sense for what life is like at Gloria Vale. You're someone who was born inside the commune. Can you tell us what daily life is like at Gloria Vale? Do you have a routine? How do you start your day? What do you do throughout the day? What happens at the end of the day? How does the daily routine of Gloria Vale actually work? Okay, so it's very routine and structured and you do the same job day after day, week after week. So it's like your own little world, like anything could be happening outside of Gloria Vale and it doesn't really impact on your life. The single girls and the... Um, like the, the men going to dairy, they're the ones getting up first. Yeah. So that's around like three, four in the morning. The dairy guys go to dairy and then single girls go to the kitchen or the laundry and start their duties there, cooking the meals, washing the clothes. And then they get the children up around half past six, quarter to seven. Yeah. So they get the children up, get them dressed, everyone makes their beds, tidy their room, and so you're all set to go to breakfast in the main hall, and then all the school children go to school, and the mums take the younger preschool children home, and they get them ready for their centres, and then all the other ladies, they have rostered jobs, they are all rostered on teams, and they go to that the team leader, like as soon as they've dropped their children off at the centre, they go to the team later and report for a job. So, so you you do that what you do that sort of work until lunchtime, and then and then afternoon. What ha you do more work in the afternoon, and then what yep. you, you gather together for an evening meal. Yes, yes. And then and what happens after dinner? Then do you you have some sort of meeting, or what what happens in the community after dinner is finished? So you'd either help with dishes. The men would either help with dishes or go home and just spend some family time together. What happens on weekends, public holidays? Like, on the outside, as you know now, the weekend rolls around, everyone says, thank goodness it's the weekend, they stop, they relax. On public holidays, you would do uh, leisure activities, you'd have a break. Does the community do that sort of thing on the weekends and public holidays? What happens there? Okay, so on Friday nights, they would have a, a movie time together where they'd watch a film in the main um, gym of the school and they'd have supper there. And then Saturday morning breakfast would be half an hour later, like yeah. at eight o'clock. And but um you'd still you'd still the um be going to work. Yeah. So yeah, the dads would be going out and they would take like if any of them could take boys with them, they'd be taking them out working. And with the mums, if you had a lot of primary children, you could go and do jobs with your primaries and get replaced in the centre. But, um, yeah, the mums and dads are still working, but then trying to look after the primary children because there's no school on Saturday. And, so, and, yeah. and, and that on, on what? So Sunday's the only day that you would, what, you would stop? You'd what, Would you have some sort of church service or what happens? Yes. And, then, and then you relax, do you? Yeah, so it was really Sunday was like the family day. So we were having... I think we were having either like midday, a midday service. Yeah. So you could have like the morning to do something with your family and then the midday service and then you would have tea all together 
yeah. with the um in the main dining hall. But um public holidays you you just work like they're just a normal day. <laughs> Tell me, uh you've mentioned watching a movie on a Friday night. What is the entertainment in the community? I'm I'm assuming they must control that quite carefully. You, you couldn't just rent and watch any movie. I'm I'm assuming. Uh, what what do you do for entertainment? How do they handle things like watching a film? Yeah, so the the movies that they buy, they do um, edit them before they put oh. them like in the DVD library, yeah. or put them out um, for six night viewing. So yeah, we'd lo- watch a lot of. Um, Oh, forget the forget the name of it, but it was like the Nature Channels yeah. with um, yeah, the English guy that narrates them. I can't. Oh, uh, David Attenborough. David Attenborough, yeah, David <laughs> Attenborough, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they'd like watch a like a drama film for the second film that was like it could be a story that was like based on true events, yeah. like a a real life based film or something that was inspiring or um we did also watch a lot of uh war movies like world war Two. so yeah were they were they modern films or were they older films and when you say they edit them would they uh they would edit out things that they didn't want people to see is that what they would do yeah well with some of the like the second film was more like an adults film so yeah. sometimes they'd like edit the swearing Oh, or yeah. something was too violent or graphic. Interesting. Do you have a do you do are there any favourite films or films that you saw a few times in there that you remember? Um, yep, there's lots of films. <laughs> I used to love watching Court Jester. Yeah. <laughs> Danny K. Yeah. Yep. More when I was growing up, but I liked watching like the Jane Austen. Yeah. Tell me, at Gloria Vale. Who leads at Gloria Vale? I assume there is a hierarchy of some kind, you know, that there's a, a main leader and then there's the next tier of leadership and, you know, so on and so on. Who leads Gloria Vale? What is the leadership structure? Who's in charge, if you like? Okay, so at the moment, I believe it's Howard. So mm. Howard's the appointed leader. Yeah. And then under him, so he's he's the top, she, what they call shepherd. Yeah. So under him, there's more shepherds, which um, is fervent, fervent steadfast, Enoch, um, I think faithful pilgrim, and I might have missed someone out. And then they'd have under them the servants, which is the rest of the leaders. And then it would go from there to like the top work managers. Yeah. But most of the the work managers are in the leading circle. How, how do you become a leader? Is, do they do they pick people? Do you graduate up the leadership chain of command once you're in at the bottom level? Do you you know do they promote you? How do you become a leader and how do you move through it? Um, I they they chose who's in the leading circle. Like the leaders already there chose who's going to be in the leading circle. It's not something you can decide. Um, you want to be in and just join. You have to be chosen. Yeah. Um, my one of my brothers, my eldest brother, was actually um, chosen to be in that leading circle when he was in there, and he saw how they uh, dealt with people yeah. in the meetings, and he didn't want to be a part of it. Wow. He, so he he declined it basically. Tell me, um, when it comes to issues like Bible, uh, the Bible and theology, how's that sort of stuff treated or handled inside Gloria Vale? Um, is, it, is the Bible interpreted for you? Um, are you allowed to read theology books from outside the community? How much freedom do you have there? Um, it's very strictly controlled. The Bible is interpreted for you by the leaders. Yeah. And if you want to uh, question or discuss uh, any different view it's it's on very you're on very um shaky ground wow because yeah uh they don't really encourage a lot of um well this is my perception that the exploration into like different views in theology is not really encouraged with 
just the ordinary people, like the people who aren't leaders. Um, it's basically only the people that are leaders that can interpret scripture correctly. Yeah. Basically, that's how you're you're brought up thinking. And and do they um, do they do any study, or is it all? internally so they, they they maybe study as a group but they don't read outside authors or theologians they don't do uh, a degree in scripture study or anything like that it's all internal is it um i i don't know of anyone that's done like like gone to a bible college except yeah. for hopeful yeah. and he often talked about like his time when he went to bible college but i don't think any of the other leaders have done that sort of study um, there are a few of them that have done extensive like research into the history of like the church through the ages. Yeah. But um, basically, earlier when they made up the book What We Believe, they decided there everything that we were going to believe and basically stopped there. And it's like we've already got all the knowledge, there's nothing else we need to learn, so we're not going to open the doors for yeah. any more growth. Uh, that's, that's how I see it. Yeah. What, what what had happened if someone said, hey, um, does this passage of Scripture really mean what you say it means? So if they questioned the leaders or they questioned an interpretation, you said they'd be on thin ice. Could, could they get in real trouble for doing something like that? Yes, well, my, my husband actually when he talked to his dad, um, he wanted to know why um, the leaders wanted unquestioning, unquestioning obedience from him. And he said, what scripture can you give me to back that up? And yeah. his dad <laughs> said to him, um, quoted to him, obey the scripture, obey them that have the role of you. Yes. And so my husband said, okay, so that makes you rollers. And um, your roller then, not a, you know, not like a shepherd. And yeah, his dad said to him, you be careful what you say. You're on very shaky ground. Wow. Basically, wow. like, yeah. So if you keep pushing it, you you could be expelled. Is that what yeah, the suggestion you will is? be. There's yeah. no question about that. You will be expelled if you keep pushing that. Um, what, did, what did you know about life? Because you, you were born there. You grew up there. What did you know about life outside of Gloria Vale? And were you aware of the world outside? Obviously, you knew something was out there. What were you told about us normies, I suppose, outside of Gloria Vale? What, what did you think about okay, life outside? So, yeah, so you um, you were taught that there's a lot of evil and wickedness and that was the devil's domain. Out, Like you'd refer to it, people out in the world. Yes. Um, yeah, for people that weren't in Gloria Vale. And yeah, so being in Gloria Vale was safe. Um, it, it ensured your salvation if you stayed there. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, which is very different to my experience on coming out of Gloria Vale. Um, I've just found so much kindness from yeah. the church groups and even people like in the South Canterbury region where I've been. Um, they're just so kind. They're not even professing Christians. And it's, it shouldn't be, but it's quite a stark difference to um, Christianity and Gloria Vale. Yeah. It's sort of hard to explain to someone that hasn't lived there. Because if you go there as a visitor, you'll be treated differently uh, than if you're just um, living there. So are you saying they put on a bit of a show for a visitor and then when the visitors are gone... It's a lot harsher. Yes. You're married. You got children. Yeah. How did yeah. you come to be married? Um, did, was it? Did you fall in love with your husband, and there was a marriage proposal, or was it arranged? Or you know, do they tell you who you're going to marry? How did that all happen? Okay, so they don't teach the concept of falling in love. Yeah. I mean, they say it in a bad light. Like the world has the notion of falling in love, and if you fall in love, then you can fall out of love. Yeah. So um, that's taught in that light. Yeah. So my marriage. Um, so hopeful talked to my husband when he was single, and 
he said that he needed to go away and pray about who the Lord wanted him to marry. And I'm pretty sure they give them a list of names. Wow. Um, when, yeah, so they give them a list of names to go away and pray about, and then they'll come back like in a few days to Hopeful, and he said, oh, what do you think about so-and-so? So Hopeful basically um, said, this is the girl, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, and then the young man would um, go and talk to her father, and then the father would talk to the girl. Then Yeah, so the parents would talk to the girl. Um, for me, I didn't expect to get married because I had been chosen to go on like a missionary trip to India. Yeah. So, yeah, I was 22. I had finished my diploma in early childhood education. I was one of the oldest girls. Um, and there was always more single girls than single men. So I thought, okay, you know, yeah. someone's not going to get a husband. And, you know, I should prepare myself not to get married. Wow. Yeah, so... Um, and you were 22 and you are thinking that? Yep. Wow. Out of the blue, my dad says, oh... Um, someone's coming to ask you to marry them, but I'm not going to tell you how it is. <laughs> I'm just like, that, that isn't normal. They, the dad usually tells the daughter oh, yeah, who's okay. coming to ask them. Uh, that was just, that was probably just my dad. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, even though there is a proposal, it, it is actually arranged, but yeah. it's done in a way that it seems like it's a proposal. Yeah. So are, are you, how old are people when they do this? Like the average age, someone, you know, so you're saying 22 and you thought you might never get married. Does that mean people get married young? Yes. So yeah, girls, like once you're 23 or 24, it's sort of like you're, you're like the, um, you're past the Joe by date. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Man. Yeah. Were there ever people who wanted to marry someone that they had fallen in love with but was not on the list and were prevented from doing that? Did that ever um, happen? I've heard stories of yeah of young people that wanted to marry someone else but they had to marry who Hopeful said they were going to marry. Wow. Yeah, so um, there have been some, some real issues in some of the marriages, which is really sad. I mean... I feel really blessed and fortunate because I've had such a happy marriage. Yeah, yeah. But um, there have been some marriages that they just haven't worked and there's some, just been ongoing issues in those people's lives and I just feel really sorry for them. Yeah. Tell, tell me, what what about things like scandal or crisis within, with like inside Gloria Vale? So like in the real world, it, you know, it, it involves human beings and human mistakes get made and human sinfulness and everything else. Frail, the frailty of human nature, right? Mm -hmm. So people yeah. commit adultery. They might steal things. There might be domestic abuse. All those kind of scandals and, and uh, different mm -hmm. moments of crisis that can arise. I'm mm -hmm. assuming stuff like that must have happened inside Gloria Vale as well. How were things like that handled? Did they deal with it? Was it hidden away? What, what happens? Mostly they would they would stand up and they would talk about what had happened and they'd, they would sometimes or sometimes not say the person's name. Basically, it was like a public denouncement, you might say. Yeah. Um, so that would be after like a meeting that the ladies would have with them yep. and the person would repent and ask for forgiveness and probably depending on who it was or what the issue was, they would often stand up and make a public apology as well. Yeah. But I think, yeah, a lot of things were actually swept under the carpet and not talked about. Yeah. And to me, it wasn't the fact that mistakes happen or wrong things did happen. It was more that they don't want to admit that they did. They don't want to face up to what actually happened and be honest. Yeah. yeah. Do you... Obviously, people have left, and it seems a lot more of late have left Gloria Vale. Do you remember as a kid growing up when anyone leaving, or is that sort of something that happens quietly and they don't talk about it? You know, how do they handle someone leaving? Do you remember people leaving? Um, my earliest memory of someone leaving, I think I was, what, eight? Wow. Yep. 
so my best friend, uh, a girl in my grade, her family went, and I just remember I just kept crying and crying. Yeah. I couldn't stop crying. I was really because she was my best friend, and then one day she was gone. Did, did you? How did did they? Did they? How did they talk about that after she'd gone? Did they just? You don't mention the person. What happens? Uh, I don't remember at that age that anything mm. was said, but I have had like brothers go, sister go, yeah. dad go, husband go. Yeah. Um, I've had friends like my age that were in my grade that have been married and they've went and they often publicly um, denounced and yeah talked about how they're evil and wicked and they're trying to destroy the church if they go on media and say anything. So, yeah, yeah I would be considered an enemy of the church by speaking out publicly as I am now. Tell me, have you had, uh, has there ever been an opportunity, or will there be an opportunity for you to reconnect with your friend? When you were eight years old, you remember her because the family left. Have Have you been able to track them down or, or is, is, um, is there no way of doing that? The family... I'll just say that to my, so my best friend's brother, older brother actually married my older sister. Yeah. So in that family, the older children, like the teenagers, were given the choice of staying yeah. at Gloria Vale with no relatives, no mum and dad, or going with their mum and dad. And some of them stayed. And one of the young men from that family actually married my older sister. Wow. Yeah, so via family, so they ended up going to Australia. Yeah. And, yeah, I I haven't talked to her. Wow. That's since, it. That's I it. haven't seen her since, yeah, since I was eight. Do you remember um, when Phil Cooper exposed his father, uh, who's known as Hopeful Christian inside the commune, obviously, um, and outside everyone knows him here as Neville Cooper. Now, he went to jail uh, his son wrote the book. Do you remember that incident? Do you remember, was it hidden in the community? Did they talk about it at all? Um, I don't I don't remember um, Phil Cooper, but I remember them hopeful often would talk about how they came to kidnap prayer and the, took the children. And yeah. um, I remember hopeful going to prison because all the families would take turns visiting him. Yeah. But I never knew what he had done. We were just told that he was um, being persecuted for his faith. Yes, so, I didn't. I didn't find out what he had done, or about what had happened. Really happened to Phil Cooper and his family until I came out, and I actually read Phil's book, and it just it just made me so sad yeah. because I saw the same thing still happening. Yeah, like to my older brother and his wife, yeah. that that hopeful did too his own son and his wife. They will just keep them apart at all cost. So, because he went to jail for, everyone on the outside knew he'd been jailed for sexual abuse. But on the inside, you're saying in the community, they were told that he was, what, he was being persecuted by the world or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, wow. I never knew that he had been a sexual offender. Wow. That's, that's unbelievable. Um, do you remember the incident in 2015 when um, that the very tragic death of a 14 year old prayer ready uh, inside was inside the timeout room or something? Um, yes, she's my younger sister. Oh, I, I did not know that. Um, it's okay. Th that yes. that what was that like, and how is grief like that processed in the community? Do they deal with that grief? How did they deal with that? Okay, sadly, at that time. Um, with our family, we couldn't process that grief. Yeah. So the events around that were a little bit complicated because it was my sister's child that was really sick. Mm. And yeah, it was a real shock. It was a real shock. Um, I remember my younger brother coming and telling me, oh, he rang me up on the phone and said, Pre's dead. I'm like, no, what are you talking about? And he was just shaking. Yeah. And he came and got me and he took me to the room. And I was just like, I I couldn't process it. It was just, just too shocking. And, yeah, 
what was really difficult for our family is that the truth wasn't actually able to be told, I believe. So my younger brother and two younger sisters that were real close to prayer and age, it really, really affected them because they weren't allowed to talk about how they felt about it. So all that hurt just got internalised and it couldn't it couldn't um, get processed for them. So it actually it took them years. Um, they blamed themselves, like they even contemplated, you know, committing suicide oh, because no. they thought it was their fault that she had died. Oh, but awful. yeah, like there was no counselling. We carried on the next day, went to work, like you know, prepare for the funeral and all that. But I was just like back into normal work. Look, first of all, thank you for your honesty and, and talking about, you know, obviously this is your family that we talk about, not just an incident, but, mm -hmm. and feel free not, if you don't want to talk too much more about that's fine, but do you feel that the truth was told to the outside authorities? Because this has been one of the things that made a lot of headlines outside mm -hmm. about that incident. And it still feels like we haven't quite been told the full story. Yeah, I... I don't think the family's voice was really heard. Mm -hmm. I think my mum and dad were allowed to speak, but we were all, I was like the family was there with the coroner. We were all sitting around a table, but there were leaders there as well. And it was like, you know, it was like a mutual understanding that we weren't allowed to say anything. It was only mum and daddy that were allowed to talk. Wow. And then it was limited on what they could say because there were other people sitting there. So the family couldn't actually express how they felt about it and then deal with with that and, and process going through the grieving stage. So, yeah. Wow, that, that, that must be extremely tough. Now, so that's a situation where you've talked about the leaders are there when they're talking to the coroner about mm -hmm. a very serious incident. It seems it that... Was, yeah, I don't... They could, they could have, mum and dad could have talked to the coroner on their own. I'm not sure, but at that that time, when the family was there, there were leaders there as well. That sort of oversight and constant, it's almost like surveillance, or they're there with you? Yeah. Is that quite normal inside Gloria Vale, is it? Yes, it is. What about your marriage um, and your family space? Is that like a safe space where you can talk more freely with your husband or your wife? Or are you always constantly on guard about what you say just in case someone was to report you or something like that? So if I wanted to talk to my husband about something I didn't want anyone else to hear yeah. or even suspect me of discussing, I would never talk about it in a, in a public place. Yeah. I would only ever talk to him in our bedroom wow. on our own. Um, so my husband was put out in 2018, December, and I didn't come out with our girls until 2019, October. Yeah. So um, I felt, yeah, I had to be really careful about who I talked to, what I said, because I, was, I knew I was being watched and listened to the whole time. Is is there ever were you ever aware of being afraid that maybe your children might hear one of your conversations with your husband? Is there a fear in the community that children might hear something and then tell the leaders, or is is that a concern? Um, yeah, that can be a concern. Yes. When, when did when did you first begin to realise that maybe something was wrong about Gloria Vale? When did you perhaps in yourself start to think? I don't think this is right here. I, I, I think this is serious and it's not good. When Do you remember what, what it was or what, what when that began to happen for you? Yes. Yeah, so I think the thing that triggered for me was finding out what Hopeful had made my mum and dad do. That was really mind-blowing because I don't believe a, a man of God mm. could do something like that. So that's when I first started thinking something's wrong. Um, so I only found out, was it a couple of months before Hopeful? No, it was like a couple of weeks before he died. Yeah. And then the other thing that sparked it too was my younger brother, who had been put out when he was only 17, 
he was really struggling still with prayer dying and um, he had come, he needed to come and talk to mummy and daddy and visit them often. Yeah. And I remember the scene, he had like three leaders holding him back yeah. from getting to my mum and Hopeful was standing there beside her, like right next to her and stroking her on the arm with this look on his face like, I can do anything I want to your mother and there's nothing you can do to stop me. And, and I, that just, and after finding out what he had done and then seeing that scene, I was really, really angry. Yeah. And I went to my mum and I said, mummy, is this true? What actually happened? And then when she told me, I was like, right, he's got to face up to what he's done. Our family is going to go and face him up about this. So we all got together, the ones of us that were still there. One of my brothers was actually really worried because he had been chosen as a servant. Yeah. So he was trying to stop me. But my husband actually stood up for me. Yeah. So it was a meeting with just mummy and daddy and us children and then hopeful and then two other leaders and we faced him up about it. And... The horrible thing is, is that he denied everything until, because we had witnesses there, my mum and dad, until the witnesses said, yes, it's true, he did do that. Wow. So after that, I was just like, okay, if he's not, if he didn't tell the truth about that, what other lies has he told? How many other lies has he told? And the fact that the other two leaders sat there and said nothing yeah. the whole time proved that they knew or it even happened to them even. They just sat there with their heads in shame. One of them tried to stop us from talking because it was mainly me and my older sister yeah. that were saying, like, this happened and this happened. Yeah. And they tried to shut us down, but um, but Daddy actually, I was actually really, I was just, we were all really praying that mm -hmm. the Lord would actually just um, give our dad the courage to actually stand up and speak, because I believe that the leaders don't want fathers to be fathers. Yes. They don't want them to be the head of their home. They want to be the head of the homes. Yeah. The father's just a puppet. He's just there to do what they say. And I'd felt that that's what had happened in our family, that Hopeful had actually used our dad's weaknesses to actually destroy our family. And, yeah. That, that's awful. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's just no words to describe that. Um, I think of my own family. I'm a father of five kids, and uh, you, and I understand the betrayal of fatherhood that, that, and and that, that what was done to your dad and what happens to your family. I mean, it's just, um, t tell me, is that was that sort of behaviour, do you think that other leaders had copied Hopeful in doing that sort of thing? Because there was a, an issue, I think, was it about a year or so back where someone else was convicted um, for sexual offending from within the community? Or was it just Hopeful Christian who'd been doing these sorts of things? So... Um... From what I found out, other people had been doing those sort of things, what Hopeful did. But the whole, it wasn't just about what he did, it was about how he talked, yeah. what he actually talked. Um, so in people's thinking and the concept of it's, it's not the man's fault, he can't help it, this is how he thinks, he can't yeah. say no. Yeah. And then on the other side, well, if something happened to a girl, it's her fault. She must have been flirting. She must mm. have been trying to put herself out there and attract the men. Yeah. So it's, it's, it wasn't just what he did. It's what he taught. Yeah. So then you've got a whole group of people. This is how they think because this is what Hopefuls taught them. So, there, so there's they, manipulation and control as well. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. Just it's just really really awful, and yeah, just horrible. Your husband left first. Now he you you've you said earlier he he was he forced out. Is that right? Yes. So he 
he was not happy with how his sister was being treated. So yeah. his older sister is married to my oldest brother. Yeah. So my oldest brother was put out for reading religious material, a Christian book. Wow. Do you remember what the book was? Oh, I'd have to. No, I yeah. don't. Yeah. But it was it was a, a Baptist book, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But it, I think it was about helping wives and husbands to have a better relationship, oh. like a Christian. Yeah. Just a, a, something that was wholesome and good and yeah. about helping the family. And, yeah, all scriptural based. But because they didn't accept it, then he was a heretic and spreading heretical beliefs and doctrines and he had to be put out. So then they really manipulated my husband's sister to try and get her to to not have anything to do with him. They dragged her into countless leaders' meetings and just verbally, emotionally and psychologically abusing her yeah. for like years. So my, my husband wasn't happy about it, and he went to his dad. He, ta- he talked to him about it, how he wasn't happy about it, and his dad would go and talk to the leaders about everything my husband talked to him about. So they couldn't actually have a, a son father the relationship. If you question anything like that, then you're, you're, on their, um, you're on their watch list, and they'll come after you. So other, you're yeah. saying other people, were, you're on the watch list, and did yeah. they, so they started watching your husband, did they? Yeah, and then other people, like, there were other men at work, at his workplace, that would try and um, get him into trouble. Yeah. So they ended up getting him into, like, the expulsion meeting, he ended up getting expelled because he was earning money. He was doing jobs for um, people outside that they didn't know about and earning money. And they wanted control of the money and they wanted the names of the other people in Gloryvale that were involved in what he was doing. And he wouldn't give it to the, he wouldn't give them the names. So basically it came down to, if you tell us who else was involved, you get to stay. Um, your husband's now gone. You're on the inside on your own now. What was it that finally convinced you, I have to leave too? My sisters, my niece had um there was stuff going on with her um she had been approached by a married man and there was you know and then she got blamed and then for like a whole year they would said it was her fault and she was then like a target anything she said Anything she did was reported on and, yeah, it was just this downward spiral where they were just after her. And then the whole way they treated my sister-in-law and then how they talked about people that had left, like my brothers, my dad, my husband. And, yeah, I just felt really vulnerable with... um, with a lot of the male, mostly all the male members in my family gone and my husband gone. Yeah. Felt really vulnerable and I had four girls. Yeah. So I didn't want them um, being like targets for yeah. predators with yeah. no one to protect them. So that was always a worry. And yeah, that's interesting because I. I started off praying that um, my husband would come back. Yeah. And then um, someone actually gave me some sermons from different Baptist um, pastors. Yeah. And I started listening to them because what I was getting in our Sunday service at Gloryville, I just felt like this is so dead. I feel like they're just raking through the same stuff like raking through the mud over and over again every week because it was on either about you know people that were so bad that had left or you know other other doctrines that were evil 
Yeah. I'm just like, I'm dying. Spiritually, I'm dying. I just felt like I was shriveling up inside. Um, and then, of course, that was affecting, like, my children. Like, if I felt like I was shriveling, how what were they actually getting? And they really loved their dad. I love my husband. It was really hurting that we'd been separated. And that the teaching was, like, not to go with your husband because he's wicked and evil and going to hell because he's gone. Yeah. And the only way you can get to heaven is if you stay here. And the only way your children will be saved is if you stay here with them. So, yeah. And then I think the final straw was when my 10-year-old, she ran away. Yeah. So she got all all the way down, down the drive and out the front gate. It's like, is it like three to five kilometers? Wow. So she did that on her own. I didn't know until like seven in the morning. I went to make her bed and she, I found a note that she left, that she was going to, she was going to find daddy and she couldn't stand school anymore. And yeah, she, she had taken my bag and I think my torch and she was going to return them as soon as she could and please send her bike helmet and wow. jacket or something. Yeah. As 10 <laughs> yeah, year olds so do. That was, that was like yeah. the last year. I was like, okay. Yeah. Got to go. And then after that, um, Howard, who's the leader, he stood up and told everyone what she'd done. Uh, and I was just like, how can you do that to my 10 year old? She's only 10 years old. Yeah. Tell me, and, did you did you formulate a plan? Did you talk to anyone? Did 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 you think this is how I'm going to do it? This is when I'm going to do it? Or did you just say right, that's it. I'm I'm gone. And you packed your bags and you left. Yeah, it was like that. It was that quick. Yeah. So yeah, I rang my husband. I said um, I need you to come because he would have visiting every two weeks. Yes. We had get the two um, have the girls for a day and a night. So I said, can you come over early? The girls need to be with you. It's not working. We need to talk about what we can do. I said, then I was actually planning to stay longer because I was feeling bad about um, leaving my work because I'd actually been training to be um, the supervisor of one of the centres the last two years. Yeah. So I was feeling just really bad about just walking out and leaving my teaching team. Yeah. So I thought I could stay on like till the end of the year and like finish the working year. But yeah, it didn't it didn't work like that. Yeah. Couldn't stay there. What what's life like for you now outside of Gloriva? How I guess it must have first of all been a bit strange and surreal realizing that it wasn't what you'd been told it was, but how, how have you found it now cuz it's it's been less than a year, hasn't it, since you've been out? Yeah, um, it's been two months. Yeah, and so are you do you, do you are you adjusting? How did, what's it like for you? Um, so when I first came out, I was like in a state of shock. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing that Leavis finds coming out is a visual shock. You're just not used to seeing everything that you see. Yeah. 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 So um, I was quite unwell too. Yeah. Just worn out from working hard and just from what I've been through. And, yeah, the health issues I had were getting worse because I was under so much stress and pressure. So, yeah, I've definitely improved health-wise. Um, I've found, like, a real a peace come out, has come over our family. Yeah. Just been able to be together in our own home, be able to create the atmosphere of peace and love without the fear because you'd have real fear in Gloria Vale and it would it would torment you day and night, the fear that was there. But, yeah, um, I feel like I'm still transitioning because there's lots of things I'm still learning to do. Yeah. Um, like I'm still – I've got my learner's licence. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, so I've got my learner's licence and I'm training for my restricted, yeah. And because I had done early childhood teaching for 
since I was 17, I wanted to do something else. So I'm just looking at like some online jobs or just like a part-time job where I can still be like a mum at home and still keep my family the way I want to. That's awesome. Tell me just a couple of questions to finish with. Firstly, do you think that Gloria Vale can survive? Because I look at this as an outsider and it seems to me like things are starting to unravel in a very big way. So it seems a lot more people have left in the last couple of years than I've ever heard about. Um, and I remember from knowing about Gloria Vale from my childhood. Um, and also then you had um, the founder, Neville Cooper, or a hopeful Christian as he's also known. He died just over two or just on two years ago. Do you think things can keep going? Will it survive? Or do you think it's starting to actually hit a critical mass where it's starting to unravel now? I don't think things can keep going how they've been going. Um, Hopeful was actually quite charismatic as a leader and he actually really held things together. Um, He was the most dominant male, you might say, in there and he made sure everyone else knew that. Howard is not a dominant person. He's a lot more soft-spoken and I think he can be actually like overridden yeah. by some of the other more dominant leaders. So yeah, I don't think it can keep going. I think it's starting to crack and unravel and I think it needs to. Yeah. It needs to to save save the people that are still trapped in there. And I think the more stories that are told and shared, I think that will help that process. And hopefully the government agencies will help too. One of the questions I was going to ask you to finish with was um, what would you like to see happen with Gloria Vale now? Because you've got some family who are still in there, right? Mm. What What would you like, What what's your ideal? Is it that they become an open church community or that everyone leaves and it gets disbanded and the whole place gets sold? What do you? What would your ideal dream situation be? It's, it's sort of a complex question because it's not like you want to destroy everything that's there because, you know, there's, there's sincere people there and these people that do love God there. But the problem is, is that the foundation that was built on by Hopeful is actually a bad foundation. Mm. And because, yeah, it's like a cult and they follow the leader's teachings and beliefs, they can't actually change it unless the foundation is actually taken away and I start something new. Yeah, so my hope is that my family will come out um, and, yeah, come out of the fear, the torment, the suffering, and, and other people there too can be, can be released from that. Melody, thank you so much for not just having this conversation with us, but your honesty uh, and and sharing so openly about your experiences. Um, yeah, there were, there were times that I, I found myself really moved um, and powerfully touched and, and, and impacted by what you had to say. And I think, uh, like for my wife and I, we have great admiration for you and for the others who have come out and are openly sharing their stories. We think there's the, the courage that you're showing is important. And so... I am extremely grateful and I am I am absolutely confident that those who have tuned in to this episode, who have watched this and heard your story, feel exactly the same way. So a huge thank you. And I really, really mean that for, for your courage. Thank you. Everything I'm doing is just to help the people who are still trapped inside Corifa. When we wake, hear the birds and see the sun. Side by side, our fears are done. All the good times just begun Oh, we know what we have, let's hold on tight Found what we're looking for in life Call us crazy, but things are finally right With you and I, the future is bright